Well, thank you, Dareth, and good morning, everyone. Let me welcome you to this Sunday morning worship of the First Baptist Church of Sun Lake. We are absolutely delighted that you have come to worship with us this morning. If you happen to be watching live online, we are delighted that you are with us as well. If you are visiting with us this morning, we are just absolutely elated that you have come to worship with us this morning. And we invite you to visit our welcome table, which is in the foyer behind you. Someone will be there to greet you and present you with a little blue bag. In that bag, you'll find some information about our church and a couple of very short books that we know will be a blessing and an encouragement to you. Just a few announcements. If you happen to be on the stewardship committee, there is a meeting this coming Thursday afternoon at one o'clock. So if you are on that committee, your attendance is appreciated and required. Very, very important that you attend the meeting. Social committee, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, the 18th at 10.30 a.m. So if you're on the social committee, make sure you make plans to attend that meeting as well. This coming Friday, there will, uh, there will be a new session starting of the grief share. In other words, they're starting from the beginning. They've completed one and they're starting over. So if you haven't attended grief share and you would like to, it's going to meet at 10 o'clock on Friday in the Christian Life Center, observing social distancing. If you would like more information, contact Dottie Wilmore. And then, not tomorrow, as I've already said, but a week from tomorrow, Chuck, you're up, the Men's Fellowship Breakfast at IHOP at 8 a.m. Last month, last month we, had a, we had a pretty big, big group. It was, it was amazing. So, so, men, if you're available, we have a great time. We hope that you will come out this, not tomorrow, but Monday the 18th at 8 a.m. over at IHOP. If you are a committee chairman, you'll notice in the worship guide it indicates that the annual report is due. And so if you have something that you want to add to the annual report, that needs to be in the church office no later than January the 20th. If you happen to have a phone with you this morning, I know I say this every week and I know it's in the worship guide, but if you happen to have one, please make sure it's off at this time. We greatly, greatly appreciate your cooperation week by week. And now as we begin our worship this morning, Pastor George is going to come and lead us. As a matter of fact, I can see him in the TV. He's right behind me already, so he's already here. Pastor George. <laughs> they call it photobombing, right? Uh, you noticed as you came in today, we have a stack of hymn books out on the table out there. We're, we've come up with a plan that we think is a good one. Uh, we'd like for you, for those who want to, to take a book home with them and put your name in it. That'll be your book, and you can bring it to church with you, with your Bible on Sunday mornings, and sing. I know some of you, I've had so many people say they miss the hymn books because they cannot sing parts. And when you got the hymn book, you can find the alto, the bass, the tenor, and so on, and sing as a choir. So what we want you to do is have your own hymn book so you don't have to be handling hymn books that are in the uh, auditorium. We want you to take it home and use it also in your devotions. You know, when you have your time with the Lord, it's great to have a hymn book too because those hymns mean a lot to you and they bless your heart, prepare you for your time of devotion. So take advantage of that. So next Sunday, come with your own hymn book I think the old, uh, I can remember, I was brought up in a church where they carried their hymn book and their Bible with them every day, or every Sunday <laughs> to church. So uh, we're getting back to that, but it's for a good reason, all right? Great. God the Lord. You, you, you probably have never heard of this song before, but it's right from the Psalms, Psalm 94, and we trust it'll be a blessing to you. You'll know the tune. Let's stand and sing it, shall we? God the Lord from whom his vengeance comes. Yeah. 
a great song for today. How we need that. Amen. God help you. Be seated, please. Well, that's what I was just about to say. He not only photobombs, but he steals thunder. So, <laughs> no, he's exactly right. What a timely psalm in God's Word. And at the same time, how privileged we are to know the God who rules over everything, and we can trust Him with all of our heart. I do hope that you have been able to pick up one of our prayer bullet points for 2021. I believe there's about 14 suggestions on here for praying specifically about very important matters in the life of our church in terms of worship, discipleship, outreach, missions. And so I thought that week by week I would take a, take a few moments and in my pastoral prayer pray through this, only dealing with one or two per Sunday. So I encourage you to, uh, to make use of this. It, I think it will be a great aid in all of us praying throughout 2021 and expecting God to do some extraordinary things in our lives and in our families and in our church family and in the life of our nation and world. And so the next two we come to this morning says this, <clears throat> pray for the leaders Christ himself has given to our church and for their ministry of equipping and making disciples. And then next, pray that the gospel will speed ahead and be honored and that God will save unbelievers. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we do acknowledge in these most unusual times that you are enthroned above and we can rest in you. We really can. We can trust in you. We must trust in you with all of our heart, walking in your ways and asking you for wisdom and guidance every single day we live. We are dependent upon you, and that's a very good position for us to be in. For you care for your own. As the psalm we sang says, you will not forsake your people. <clears throat> Father, this morning I pray for the leaders the Lord Jesus has given to our church. I pray for their ministry of teaching and equipping and discipling. I pray, Father, that you will empower each of us who serve in these various capacities to fulfill the sovereign and gracious calling that you have given to us. I pray, Lord, that the gospel, as Paul puts it in 2 Thessalonians 3, <clears throat> that the gospel will speed ahead and that you will save unbelievers. Oh, how we long for unbelievers to hear the truth of the gospel and to come to Christ. Father, we can't make this happen. None of us can make this happen. But Lord, you can. And you have instructed us to pray. And so I ask in Jesus' name that you will honor your gospel as it is proclaimed as it is shared from day to day, as it is modeled in our world, that people will begin to see there really is hope in these crazy times. It is the hope of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you will help us day by day, by day to trust in you, lean on you, rest in you, and have no confidence in ourselves, but only in you. I ask that you would empower us to pray. I am willing, O oh Lord, to receive what you give, to lack what you withhold, to relinquish what you take, to suffer what you inflict, to be what you require, and to do what you send me to do. I pray that you will continue to guide us powerfully through our time of worship this morning. What a privilege to be with brothers and sisters in Christ, lifting up the name that is above every name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, 
our Lord, our soon coming King. In His name we pray together. Amen. He lives. He lives. I know He lives. He lives in my heart. Let's sing it together. this next verse together in all the wonders to perform. Let's sing it.
God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. I love that truth. As you know, we have been promoting our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Christmas was last year, but it wasn't that long ago, so it's not too late to give, of course, to this offering where 100% of what is given goes to those who are serving as missionaries around the world. Our goal has been that of $10,000, and we're getting close. We are a little less than $2,000 away from meeting that goal, and I think it would be wonderful, especially with everything that is happening in our world, I think it would be wonderful to meet that goal. I was very encouraged by a letter from the president of the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. Let me read just a part of this very quickly. He says, it's been a difficult year, and we'd all agree it still is. That's as true for our Southern Baptist overseas missionaries as it is for the rest of us. Some serving countries that are returning to martial law lockdowns after having endured them for months on end earlier this year. While grateful for the technology, many are weary from long days of working online. Others have been busy distributing food in refugee camps and delivering personal protection equipment to medical clinics. They've lost colleagues, some due to COVID, but others unrelated to the pandemic. Hundreds have been forced out of countries they had served for years, even decades, with very little prospect of returning. Now they face the challenge of a new assignment, learning a new language and culture. Many have been in a prolonged state of waiting for deployment or redeployment, hoping that world leaders will soon open borders and foreign governments would issue visas. Then he says this, and this next part is in bold print, yet, yet with God's help, what has been true for 175 years is still true today. Southern Baptist witness among the nations remains uninterrupted. Challenge, yes, but uninterrupted. We still have thousands of Southern Baptist's most gifted sons and daughters proclaiming Christ among the nations. And you know, many people in these nations have never even heard the name Jesus, and they know nothing of his gospel. And so you and I, along with thousands of other churches, have the great joyous privilege of giving in such a way that these folks can remain on, even if they're reassigned, remain on the field where God chooses to put them, sharing the most important message that anybody anywhere in this world could ever hear, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless you for your faithful giving. What a wonderful response thus far in, uh, in giving to international missions. I pray that it will continue for the glory of God. Bob Burkholz is going to come and lead us now as we dedicate our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, everyone. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, so many of us are prone to, prone to look out for ourselves. Give each of us the wisdom to know when giving up our selfish thoughts would best demonstrate your love and grace to others. Our lives help point our neighbors pictures of you, Lord, and we thank each of those that you give the gift of giving. Bless this offering, this day, and the service that follows. This I pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. Riches of love in Christ Jesus. The 
treasures of earth are not mine. I hold not its silver and gold, but a treasure far greater is mine. I have riches of value untold. Oh, the depths of the riches of love, the riches of love in Christ Jesus, far better than gold or wealth untold are the riches of love in Christ Jesus. The treasures of earth must all fail, its riches and honor decay. But the riches of love that are mine, even death cannot take them away. Come take of the riches of Christ, exhaustless and free is the store of its wonderful fullness received. Till you hunger and thirst never more. Oh, the depths of the riches of Christ, the riches of love in Christ Jesus, far better than gold or wealth untold, are the riches of love in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 He giveth and giveth and giveth again. Let's sing it together. Let me ask you to turn your Bibles, if you will, please, to 1 Chronicles, the Old Testament book of 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And I would like to begin reading in just a moment with verse 10. This is the account of King David 
actually leading in a time of worship as the people have brought gifts an abundance of gifts for the building of God's house, the temple. David would not be able to build it. God would not allow that, but rather had chosen that his son Solomon would build it. But David has such an important part in bringing the people together and instructing them in such a way that they give in such remarkable fashion. This is really an exciting passage of Scripture. First Chronicles chapter 29, beginning in verse 10. If you'd like to stand with me at this time, you certainly may do so. <clears throat> the Bible says, Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you. And you rule over all. In your hand are power and might. And in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, David says in verse 14, who am I? And what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you, and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. O oh Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand, and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, Keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, Bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed their heads and paid homage to the Lord and to the king. Would you pray with me? Father, we are instructed and we are encouraged and we are motivated and blessed by this extraordinary Old Testament prayer from King David. I pray, Father, that right here in the 21st century, we will apply the truth we've just heard. For we know that you are unchanging and that your promises will be fulfilled. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it seems very clear to me that we live in a watershed moment in America. When we think about this past year, we think about, of course, the invasion of a deadly global pandemic. Thousands of people have died as a result in our own nation and hundreds of thousands around the world. But there were many other events in 2020 occurring simultaneously. 
as you know, toward the end of massive shutdowns. And just as the economy was beginning to open again slowly, racial unrest exploded on the scene in our nation. And while there were many people protesting peacefully, there were many others, as you know, rioting, looting, and destroying buildings and businesses. And then when you think about the continued murder of the unborn, the celebration of every form of sexual immorality, the scourge of sex trafficking, the opioid crisis, and the very real threats to free speech and religious liberty. It seems that everything that is shakable is now being shaken. Someone said, you know what you believe, but in times like these you find out whether you believe what you know. Dr. Ronnie Floyd, the president of the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention has said this. Listen to his words. He says, the trajectory of life in America as we knew it entering into 2020 has now changed forever. Not one segment of our nation will ever be the same, including the church. He goes on to say that this is the time when the church must answer this moment, this moment in American history. And of course, the reason for that is because we have the only hope for this nation. As the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the only hope for the world. And that's the good news of the gospel, the good news that a Savior has come. And that He has paid the sin price in full on our behalf that we might be forgiven. And that we might go free and that we might have life and that we might have the assurance of an eternity with Him. We have the only hope for this world that there is. It's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. So over the next few Sundays, and this might surprise you a little bit, over the next few Sundays I want us to focus on what the Bible says about stewardship. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute. Wait a minute, how does that relate to the church responding to what appears to be a very insecure and uncertain future? Here's how it relates. The most secure step any of us can take for our future financially is to honor God in our stewardship and to do it in the way that He has outlined in His Word. And I tell you, the exciting thing is that God has given us a biblical way to look at our entire lives, including the finances that He alone has entrusted to us. And why would we not study these principles in light of so much teaching in the Bible on this subject for example, of the 38 recorded parables told by Jesus, some 16 deal with a person's use of money. 16 out of 38. Furthermore, we're told that there are more than 1,000 references to money in the Bible, second only to the subject of love. Obviously then, God is interested, very interested, in how we handle money and possessions and yet, for many years in our nation, there has been a slow decline in the ongoing financial support of our churches. We're told that back in 1968, Americans gave just over 3% of their income to the church. And by 2017, they gave only 2.13%. ,2 so what will change this pattern in the churches of our nation. The only thing I know is that of clear biblical teaching on the principles of stewardship and the work of the Holy Spirit in changing hearts. So while I deeply, deeply appreciate and rejoice in the faithful giving of so many people in our church family, there's always more for each of us to learn, right, about honoring God through the ongoing practice of generosity. So we want to see what God actually says in His Word on this subject. And a great place to begin, I believe, is in the text that I read a few moments ago 
1 Chronicles chapter 29. Now, it's important to see that change was taking place in ancient Israel during these days, big time change. David was in the advanced stage of his life, and his son Solomon had been chosen to succeed him as king. Perhaps you'll recall that David had desired to build the temple. I mentioned that a little earlier. He he desired to, he really wanted to do that. He desired to build a house for God, a wonderful temple where people would come and worship. But that wasn't God's plan. The Lord wanted Solomon to build the temple, and David's role would be to rally Israel to support this work financially. And so as we focus on verses 10 through 20, let's consider three vitally important truths. Here they are. God owns everything. God deserves praise. And God blesses generosity. Let's look at the first of these. God owns everything. David prays in verse 11, all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Notice what he says, all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Now, it's important to realize that David was not simply interested in a transition of power. That is, from him to his son Solomon. No, he was not simply interested in a transition of power. He was also interested in a transference of faith. And so, God wanted David to know and teach his people what? the reality of God's ownership of all things. Because, you see, an understanding of this truth would bring stability in the midst of instability and certainty in the midst of uncertainty. Now, this is such a foundational truth in Scripture, and it is one that we should declare boldly and unashamedly, God is the owner of everything. Therefore, he's big enough and powerful enough to provide us anything we truly need. But we are not the owners. We are simply managers or stewards of that which he has entrusted to us. David also says in Psalm 24, verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. So when we give to God, we are simply returning to Him that which He has already given to us. David and the people of God were able to give, but it was only because God first gave them everything they had. And David certainly acknowledges this reality in verse 16, doesn't he? 1 Chronicles 29, in verse 16, he prays, O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. Think about this. Even though David was the king and probably the most powerful leader in all the world at that time, even though he was the king, He recognized that he was like any other person, a stranger and a sojourner on the earth, as he says in verse 15. He knew that human life was brief, but he also knew that God was eternal. Therefore, since everything comes from God and since life is brief, the wisest thing we can do is give back to God what he gives to us and make an investment in the eternal. Yes, God owns everything. The second truth I want us to see is that God deserves praise. And this certainly stands to reason when you consider that God is eternal and that He is the creator of all things. And so David begins this magnificent prayer with praise and adoration to the Lord. You see, God had blessed David richly, so David blesses God thankfully. In verse 10, he prays, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. And then he goes on in verse 11 to acknowledge the Lord's greatness, power, glory, victory, and majesty. What a description of the nature of God. 
In Psalm 29, verses 10 and 11, David gives an example of God's greatness and power. He says, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. What a thrilling couple of verses for these troubling and threatening times in which we live. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood, says David. You see, God is never paralyzed or puzzled or frantic or surprised. Floods come, but God sits enthroned over them. Pandemics come, but God sits enthroned over them. Governments change, but God sits enthroned over them. Listen to David's prayer in Psalm 32, verse 6. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. Do you think we are headed into a time that could be called the rush of great waters? If so, what do we do? What do we do? In the next verse, David prays, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I think I have a little bit of competition <laughs> If that's a better sermon than mine, we'll stop. <laughs> Those things happen, I understand, no problem. But let me read that again because you have to love what he says here, right? David is praying and he says, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with what? With shouts of deliverance. Now, this doesn't mean that we won't ever have troubles or difficulties or even persecution. But it does mean that we are in the hands of God and that we can trust him in every situation of life. He is our shepherd and he takes care of his own. We must never lose sight of that. God takes care of his own. He protects, he provides, he leads, he encourages, he instructs, he comforts. He does everything that is needed in order to fulfill his purposes in and through our lives and ministries. Aren't you glad he is enthroned in heaven? He sits above the flood. He sits above everything. He is God on the throne in charge eternal, perfect in all of his ways, and you and I have the privilege of calling him our Father. <laughs> what a gracious, loving, powerful God we are privileged to know and serve. I love Romans 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You know, this is really the supreme display of love, isn't it? So since God gave his son for us, the one who is the ultimate treasure of heaven, we can be assured that his care for us and all his promises will stand firm throughout our lives and for eternity. Yes, God sits enthroned over the flood, and he is in control of the rush of many waters. By the way, the word corona in coronavirus actually means crown. And those pictures we've seen of the shape of the virus sort of remind us of a crown. But folks, the good news is that coronavirus is not king. Cancer is not king. Heart disease is not king. Jesus is king. And he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be made known to the nations 
of our world. I'm so glad he's king, and I'm so glad he has promised to return. And we can know that just as all of those Old Testament promises were perfectly fulfilled in the arrival of the Messiah in the fullness of time, as the book of Galatians puts it, we can be certain that the Lord Jesus himself will come back again just as he has promised to do. I'm telling you this morning, no matter what happens in this nation, no matter what happens in this world, Jesus is king. Hallelujah. What a savior. What a redeemer. What a friend. He is the lover of our souls. And he says what? He says at the end of the gospel of Matthew, I will never leave you. I am with you to the end of the age. Who would have thought that I would get excited preaching from 1 Chronicles chapter 29? How can we not be excited when we read a prayer like David is praying in this passage of Scripture? So anytime, think about this now, anytime we receive an offering in a church service, it is not an interruption in the flow of worship. It is worship. It is worship. And all of the Israelites were bringing an abundance of gifts in order that a house for God, known as the temple. Now realize, we don't have temples today like they did then. We are the church, and the church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ, and we all understand that truth. But in the Old Testament, there was to be a temple. There was to be a house for God himself, where the people would come regularly and make sacrifices and worship him. And so the people understand that, and David has instructed them and led them and modeled the right kind of leadership and behavior. And so the people are giving and giving and giving, but David is worshiping. Don't miss that. He is all through this, this chapter. He is connecting the principles and the act of giving with worship because giving from the heart to God is worship. And every time we do that, it is to be an act of thanksgiving and praise and adoration and worship to God. He owns everything. He deserves praise. And thirdly, God blesses generosity. David speaks in verse 17 of the offerings coming from his heart and from the hearts of the people. The Bible says they gave freely. They gave joyously. And David prays that his people will always have hearts of generosity, gratitude, and joy. And that they will always be loyal to their God. In other words, they should worship God alone and never make wealth their God. You see, this is what the Lord blesses. This is what he honors. He delights in his people's generosity. Well, when you go on and read further in that prayer of David in 1 Chronicles 29, you see that he prayed for his son Solomon. Certainly a loving father would do that, especially when the son is about to become the king over Israel. But then, having prayed for his son David called on the congregation to bless the Lord. Now, how did they respond? They responded correctly. They praised the Lord. The scripture says they knelt low and paid homage to the Lord and to the king. As Bible teacher Warren Wiersbe has said, what a way to begin a building program. So when we recognize God's ownership and live a life of praise to Him and give in a way that honors His name, we are a blessed and joy-filled people. And it's because we are standing on scriptural truth and the promises of God. We're not depending on bank accounts. We're standing on scriptural truth and depending on God himself. In 1874, when funds at the China Inland Mission were about depleted, 
missionary Hudson Taylor wrote to his wife saying, the balance in hand yesterday was 67 cents. Do you know his next statement? The Lord reigns. Herein is our joy and confidence. <laughs> now we might imagine that he would have said, dear wife, we only have 67 cents. What are we going to do? No, he said, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. He rules. He what? He sits over the flood. He's in charge. He can be trusted. Herein, Hudson Taylor said, is our joy and confidence. And by the way, the balance got even lower, if you can imagine that. And so he wrote to a friend saying, we have this and all the promises of God. Yes, we have 60 cents, 50 cents, 30 cents, whatever it is. And, and we have the promises of God who always fulfills his promises. And he did in the life and ministry of Hudson Taylor. God never failed to provide. There, folks, there, it, for some of you perhaps have studied this story, but there is no way to even begin measuring the impact of missionary Hudson Taylor and the people he disi discipled in the land of China back in the 19th century. You know, when I was growing up, and perhaps many of you grew up singing this song as well, we would oftentimes sing standing on the promises. That last stanza says, standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting, oh that's a good word for these troubled days, isn't it? Resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. My friend, today you are standing on something. Are you standing on what God says in his word or are you trusting in something else? Oh, I tell you, rejoice in the fact that God is the owner of everything. That's not a negative, that's a positive. There's such security in that reality. I mean, if the car breaks down, I can pray, Lord, your car broke down. Please give us the resources to have it fixed. Now, I know that sounds rather amusing, but it's really true. God does own everything. We own nothing. We own nothing. We are stewards, managers of what he has entrusted to us in order that we might use what he has entrusted to us for his glory for the upbuilding of his church on this earth and for the outreach to the nations of our world with the good news. The fact that God owns everything should give us great peace, perfect rest, magnificent joy. Sometimes a person will be facing a decision or challenge of some kind and a person will try to encourage that friend and will say, You've got this. You got this. Well, I want to tell you this morning, in these unprecedented times, we can honestly say, God has this. <laughs> Amen. He has this. He does. He has you. He has your family. He has your church. Oh, he's got this. How do we know? He's enthroned over the flood. He controls the rush of many waters. He gives strength to his people. He blesses us with peace. He preserves us from trouble. He surrounds us with shouts of deliverance. All glory be to the God who owns everything, who deserves praise, and who blesses generosity. Let's pray together. This morning, Father, I pray with David, blessed are you, O oh Lord, the God of Israel, 
our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. And so, dear Father, we worship you today. We worship you. You are worthy, infinitely worthy of our praise, our adoration, our thanksgiving. How great you are. Great beyond description. And it is in the saving name of the Lord Jesus that I pray, amen and amen. Let's stand and let's sing, How Great Thou Art. Shall come with shout of man. 